in the name of the Father, Yahweh, or Yah, for short, through his son, Messiah, whose Hebrew name is Yahweh Shah. We bring the message of the midweek, which is Wednesday night, which we have been doing now for a month or so, I guess, since this COVID virus has uh, started. And um, tonight's message, what we're dealing with tonight is a subject that I did not realize until very recently. Um, some of the brethren are misapplying. And the reason, I, and I don't want to just be out here trying to correct my Hebrew brothers. That's not my, that's not my position or point. But I do want to protect people from things that can cost them their life. That's, that's what I'm saying. I want to protect people that are seeking truth from following things that might hurt them. And that's, that's my only object here. Because as we, as we believe in the Father, the Most High God, the only true God, I believe about him, anyone on the planet that is actively seeking things with their life, to bring glory to the Father is going to end up following the truth. Let me say it again another way. Any person that is truly repentant and truly seeking to honor their creator for his glory is going to end up following the truth. We may not all be on the same page right now, but at the end of the day, we will be. But in the meantime, I understand, and I know some mo many of you that follow this ministry understand that Asatan, our enemy, is using his agents in human form, oftentimes to bring as much deception and confusion to the Israelites as possible, to, to most highest true people who I believe are Israelites. I believe it's the, so, the, the main group of Israelites, of course, is the so-called African-Americans or the black men. And again, let's just go over some scriptures that just illustrate what we're talking about here. Um, of course, Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 12. I'm going to start reading from Revelation chapter 12. I'm going to read from verse 9. And I'm going to read from verse 9 down. Actually, I'm going to start before that. I'm going to read from verse. I'm going to read from verse 1. I'm going to read from verse 1 down to verse 11. Yeah. Actually, from verse 1 down to verse 12. Yes, I'm going to read from verse 1 down to verse 12 of Revelation chapter 12. We have a lot of scriptures. That's why I'm getting right into it today. There's a lot of scriptures that we're going to be going through today. And I'm very happy that we have this by the grace of the most high recorded both on Periscope and in YouTube because uh, it, those interested in this particular subject we're getting ready to go into are going to need to review all the scriptures that we bring forth, all the witnesses we're bringing forth from the Bible uh, more than once because there's a lot of them. Um, shalom. And um, this particular uh, subject is going to dwell on Edom, Moab, and Ammon, as it appears in Daniel chapter 11. And we're going to go there in a few minutes. But before we do, let's just get a backdrop. I'm going to read Revelation chapter 12 from verses 1 down to verse 12. From verses 1 down to verse 12. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man child 
who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto Yah and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of Yah that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And verse seven. And there was war in heaven. And Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great red dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil in Asatan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a great voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our most high and the power of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our most high day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore, rejoice ye heavens and them that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath. For he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Let's go through this very quickly. The woman that was clothed with the sun and the moon and, and the stars on her head. And, and of course, we know that the number 12 is significant. In fact, the Bible uses uh, various forms of numbers uh, for different reasons, right? Um, and it uses the number 12 to represent his people, 12 tribes, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles. Right, 12 apostles. And then, of course, uh, we have here 12 stars. And of course, in the New Jerusalem, 12 gates, right? 12 gates, where each gate has on it the name of the 12 tribes of Israel. So we know this woman, and of course, the Bible does say, I have likened Zion unto a comely and delicate woman. Also, we know that Joseph had a dream. Joseph, the son of Jacob, had a dream in the book of Genesis. And in his dream, Joseph saw the sun and the moon and the 12 stars. And Jacob answered him and said, do you think that, they said that they, paid, they made obeisance to him. And Jacob Hold the, hold the dream. Let's take a look at the dream in Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. Uh, Genesis 37. Actually, he had two dreams in Genesis 37. I'm going to begin at verse 5 and go down from verse 5 down to verse 10. And Joseph dreamed a dream and told it his brethren, and they hated him yet more. And he said unto them, here, I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and, uh, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaf stood around about and made obedience to my sheep. And his brethren said to him, shalt thou indeed reign over us? And shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream, and it told it to his brethren. And said, behold, I have dreamed the dream more and behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars made obeisance to me. See, and he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I, my and thy mother and thy brethren, indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee and the earth? To the earth. And so, the dream is showing, among other things, that the moon and the stars represent the nation of Israel. It represents the, the 12 tribes. So this woman in chapter 12 is the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, the Bible says in, re, in that same we read where the dragon, a great red dragon that has seven heads and 10 horns tried to devour the child that the woman had. The nation of Israel gave birth to a child. Who was the child? Obviously it was Messiah. 
And did, did the dragon try to devour the child? Absolutely. The Edomite king, Herod, in fact, let's take a look at that real quick. Again, we're going to go through a lot of scriptures today, and I'm going to be moving quickly because there's some important stuff I want to hit. And so I'm just doing some backdrop so that we'll be all on the same page as much as possible. So we go to Matthew chapter 2, and we see Matthew chapter 2, and the Bible says, uh, actually, I'm going to start at chapter 1 because I'm going to have to hit another. There's another thing in chapter 12 of Revelation that's involved in this. So let's take a look here. In Matthew chapter 1. And I'm going to begin at the point where Mary, Miriam is pregnant. And Joseph is not the father. And Joseph understands he's not the father. So they had already an contractual agreement in terms of they were uh, betrothed. So she was to be his wife. They had not consummated the marriage. And yet she was pregnant. Now Joseph was going to end the contract quietly. And the reason he was going to end it quietly, because according to Deuteronomy 23, if this situation was to, was to become public, Miriam was supposed to be stoned. If a woman was found to not be a maid or to be with another man while she was betrothed to, to a man, she was to be stoned. So this is what this is what was going through Joseph's mind. As we read Matthew chapter one, beginning at verse 19, and I'm going to go down into chapter two. And I was going, I'm going to go down to chapter two and go down to verse six. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. See, he was going to make it a quiet divorce, a breaking of the agreement, the, the covenant that they were going to make to be man and wife so that she would not be stoned. He didn't want to make her a public example, which means she would have to be publicly stoned. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of Yahweh appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Miriam thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the set-apart spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name, well, it says here in big letters, Jesus, but his true name in the Hebrew is Yahweh Shai, for it means Yah exists to save. And he says here, for he shall what? Save his people from their sin. Now, all this was done that it might be fulfilled of the Lord by the prophet saying, behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted Yah with her. And Joseph being raised from sleep did as the angel of Yahweh bidden him and took him his wife and knew her not. So she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Yahweh Now, the angel named him Jesus, or Yahweh That was his name when he was born on the earth as a babe. That was not his name previous to this, for he did exist prior to this. Remember, the word was with Yah, and the word was Yah. The same was in the beginning with Yah. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Remember, it was also this same Yahweh that was standing with his sword drawn in front of Joshua, where Joshua said, are you for us or for our adversaries? Joshua chapter five, where, jo where he told Joshua, no, but as captain of the host of Yahweh, am I now come and take your shoes off of your feet for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua bowed down and worshiped him and took his shoes off. Okay, because that was the same Messiah, but his name was not Yahweh Shah at that time. Okay, we're going to talk about that as we get to Revelation, back to chapter 12 for a minute. Chapter 2 of Matthew. Now, when Yahweh Shah was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Israelites? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Messiah should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. So Herod was. Trouble. 
He wasn't happy about the prospect of the Messiah being born. And of course, we see later on in, in the same chapter, I'm going to start at verse, let's see, I'm going to start at verse 13, start at verse 13. I'm going to go from verse 13 down to verse 16, Matthew chapter 2, 13 to 16. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of Yahweh appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. And was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled with your spoken by the prophet saying, out of Egypt have I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem in all the coast thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently acquired of the wise men. So that was the dragon of Revelation chapter 12 that sought to devour the child that the woman had. That was Herod trying to kill Messiah. Okay. So far, hope you all with me. Now let's go back to Revelation chapter 12. So the man child, of course, is Messiah, who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. That's when Messiah returns to establish his kingdom. He's going to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Or, as a matter of fact, he's going to destroy all heathen. Okay, we're going to talk more about that. But back to Revelation chapter 12. Now, the Bible says there was war in heaven in verse 7. It says, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. Now, this is important on a number of levels. Number one, notice they're using the word Michael or Mishael or Mikael to describe Messiah. Why are they using the term Michael instead of Yahusha or Jesus? Why are they using Michael in this scenario? Let me explain. Anything that took place prior Prior to the birth and the begottenness of Messiah, where his name was announced to be Yahweh or Jesus, anything that took place prior to that, his name was Mikael, which means one who is like the Most High, one like the Most High. And that describes Messiah. Messiah is not the Most High, but he is a representation of the Most High. He represents the Most High to us. He is the intercessor between us and the Most High, and he represents the Most High to us. When we pray, we pray to the Most High, but we pray through the intercessor who is Messiah, who causes our prayers to be accepted of the Most High because of his perfection of righteousness that he represents to us because the Bible shows us, and we're going to read in a few minutes, his, his name, one of his name is going to be called the Lord our righteousness, or Yahweh Sadat, which means Yahweh's righteousness. That's his, that's his representation. So this event that's being described in Revelation chapter 12, where it says Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, this battle took place in, in the third heaven prior to the advent of Messiah. Using the word Michael. Okay, so you'll see Michael in an event that took place prior to Messiah's advent or an event that's being described in the Old Testament, like Daniel describes him as Michael, because Daniel did not know what his name was going to be. So Daniel was this Gabriel described him to Daniel as Mikael. Okay, again, let's just look at Jude for a second witness to this effect in the book of Jude. And Jude only has one chapter, but let's look at Jude. Chapter 9, I'm excuse me, Jude verse 9, verse 9 of Jude. Notice what it says. Yet Mikael, the archangel, when he contended with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Most High rebuked thee. Again, this is an event that took place prior to his birth as Messiah. Okay, what event they describe in there? Remember, Moses was not permitted to lead the children of Israel into the, into the promised land because he did not glorify Yah in the waters of strife. Remember that? And so what happened, the Bible describes it like this. It says Moses went up into Mount Nebo in Moab, and the Bible says he died there. No man knew where he was buried, and it just says he buried him there. 
That's all it said. It doesn't say Aaron buried him or the children of Israel buried him. They didn't know where he was buried, but it says he buried him there. Who buried him? Yah buried him and then later resurrected him. Okay, and that's why when 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 Mike Mikael came to resurrect the body, the Asatan was there to contend with Mikael, and Mikael said, "Just the Most High rebuked." That was that. Okay, so now in Revelation chapter twelve, you see a situation that took place prior to his advent, and you see Asatan was cast out of the kingdom, cast out of the third heaven. Okay, now. They call him here in Revelation chapter 12, the accuser of the brethren. Why did they call him the accuser of the brethren? Let me give you a good example of that aspect. If you recall, Job was tested by Asatan with Yah's permission. And what was the test based on? Asatan came to the Most High and said, I represent the earth. And he said, he said, what are you doing here? He said, I come from going to and fro on earth, from walking up and down. And he said, have you not considered my servant Job? In other words, Asatan, Job is representing me in the earth. And then Asatan said, does he represent you for nothing? you got a hedge about him. You made him rich. you blessing him. Take all that stuff from him and he'll curse you to your face. He was accusing Job. And he did it three times. Okay. He was accusing Job. All right. That's why he's called the accuser of the brethren. Now, he was cast out into the earth, and we know he, is, he was there in the Garden of Eden, and we know he tempted Adam and Eve, and we know what happened. Okay, But here in Revelation, it says, and it says here in Revelation chapter 12, it says, the accuser of the brethren was cast out, which, which accused them before our God day and night, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. We need to understand this. So brothers and sisters, we're consistent in what we teach in that the righteousness by faith message is the most important message, the most important doctrine in the Bible. And again, why do I always say that? Because through the doctrine of righteousness by faith, a person can overcome all sin. And there is nothing more important in terms of what Messiah came and died for, was resurrected for, and is now our high priest for, than to cause his people, what did it say? He will save his people from their sins. And again, under the new covenant, the Most High says, I will remember their sins, their iniquities forgiven, and I will remember their sins no more. Why does he do that? Because of the blood of the Lamb. And the word of their testimony. Testimony. What is that? Testimony. You look up the word testimony in the Greek. It's the root word for what you call a martyr or a witness. Now, the witness is a major theme in the Bible. And we are called to bear witness of the character of the Father's righteousness. That's what the righteousness by faith message is about. It's about, matter of fact, the gospel the definition of the gospel, it is the power of Yah. Remember Romans chapter 1, 16 and 17. It is the power of Yah unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, that is in the power of Yah, the righteousness of Yah is revealed. So through the gospel of righteousness by faith, Yah intends that we should bear witness of his righteous character. And that's how we overcome Asatan. Through the blood of the lamb, we are forgiven our sins. Through the power of perfect righteousness given to us in the spirit of the father, we overcome sin. And we bear witness of Yah's righteousness. And that's what they're talking about. They overcame him by Yah's, by the blood of the Messiah, and by the righteousness of the father. That's what we're talking about. Okay? Now, let's continue. Therefore rejoice. Well, first of all, it says, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Before we get that, it says in that same verse 10, uh, wait a minute, verse 9, that old serpent called the devil and the set and Asatan, which does what? He deceiveth the whole world. He deceiveth the whole world. I want to 
stop here for a minute, minute, just a couple minutes. We don't have a lot of time to stay on any of these subjects because I want to get to Edom, Moab, and Ammon very quickly in a few minutes. But let me just say this to you, brothers and sisters. If you come to a knowledge of the truth, any person on planet Earth, listen now, any person on planet Earth that comes to a knowledge of the truth is coming out of deception. Any person. So that means any of us that come to truth and light is coming out of darkness. All of us. We start off being deceived. And Yah brings us truth. Can't nobody ever say two things. You can't never say you never lied. Because if you do, you lying. And you can't never say you've never been deceived. Because he's deceived the whole world. All of us been deceived. Okay. But the Bible says in Proverbs 4.18, the path of the just is as the shining light, which shineth more and more unto the perfect day. So we're always growing. That's what I've learned myself since I come out of Christianity and came into this truth about the, who the true Hebrew Israelites are, who the true nation is, who the Messiah really is, that he's not some Caucasian man from Europe. He's not no Gentile, but really he's of the tribe, a line of the tribe of Judah, a, a man of color, a black man. When I come to these information and this, this knowledge, certain things became clear to me. And one of the things became clear is when I was a Christian, I was not growing in knowledge and truth. I was not growing in the power of Yah's spirit. The only thing that was happening to me as a Christian is I was a veteran of being a Christian. Like I had been in a Christian church for 20 years. I was fourth generation in the, in the SDA church. That's the only thing I had to show for being a Christian. I was still struggling with the same sins that I had been struggling with when I first came. But since I've come to this truth and come to understand the power of the Father, I've, I've been getting victories by the grace of the Most High. It's not me, it's him. I've been getting victories. I've been feeling what that liberty that the Bible is talking about. And I've been growing in knowledge of truth every year. And I understand now, I'm going to continue to do that for the rest of eternity. All of us are. So we're always advancing in knowledge of truth. And the key to doing that in my case, I, can, I think some of you can agree, is in being repentant and humble. Repentance and humility. In other words, I, I have no problem admitting when I'm wrong about something. I have no problem admitting when I've taught something before that I thought was true and I come back to find out it wasn't true. I have no trouble admitting that because that's how I learn. That's how all of us learn. See, when we get to the point where we don't think we can learn, we're in trouble because we're not Continuing in the path of light, path of the justice as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Okay, so I must continue to learn by by Yah's spirit. And let me tell you something: we're, when we're dealing with the Most High Yah, the only true God, the Bible says about Him that His understanding in Psalm one forty seven it tells us His understanding is infinite. There's no limit to how much He knows. Therefore, as long as I'm in this clay and this infinite life, I'm going to be learning all the time. And he's always showing me that. OK. But if I'm convicted that something is true, I'm going to bring it as true. I must. OK, because I've been called to teach his word. OK. So here is telling us, Asatan deceived the whole world. OK, he deceived the whole world. And so when we're coming in the truth, we're coming out of darkness. All of us are. All of us. Okay. So let's go over now. Edom, Moab, and Ammon. Let's go to that scripture real quick. Right, I'm just going to touch base on it. Then I'm going to surround. I'm going to give you more backdrop. I'm going to come back to it. Okay. That what I'm talking about is Daniel chapter 9. I'm sorry. Daniel chapter 11. I'm sorry. Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. And now... You know, at some point we were going, we we're going to study Daniel this year. I had planned on studying it. Right now we're studying Isaiah and have planned on studying Daniel after we studied Isaiah. But I'm really torn because I'm really wanting to study Jeremiah next. So I'm still praying about that. If y'all can pray about that with us so we can know what we should do next. But I'm really wanting to go through our Jeremiah 
because it's so uh, apropos, well, both books are apropos to where we are right now in history. But in Daniel chapter 11, as you get through, as you're reading Daniel chapter 11, it starts off um, as actually following up from what Daniel chapter 2 showed. Daniel chapter 2 showed four empires. Those four empires were Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, and Rome. And then through Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8, and then Daniel chapter 10 and 11, they start to show you the progression of those empires as you get down to Rome. And Rome is different from all the other empires in Daniel 7, because out of Rome comes the little horn. Okay? I'm just giving you a synopsis, but we're going to read through this part of Daniel chapter 11 that has to do with this Edom, Moab, and Ammon. But what happened now, Rome starts off in historical terms as a pagan power. A pagan power, just like Babylon and Media Persia and Greece. A pagan power. But as it turns religious, it becomes more than a pagan power. It becomes a Papal power, P-A-P-A-L, papal power. So that out of Rome, you have the little horn that represents a religion that is also a government that is a center of worship and that's worldwide influence. That's what Daniel 7 shows us. That's what Daniel 2 shows us in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. That's what Daniel 8 shows us. And that's what Daniel 11 shows us. So at the end, there's a development of this uh, transition from pagan to papal. It's, it's shown in Daniel chapter 11. Okay. Now, at the end, there are two powers in Daniel chapter 11. That all the skirmishes it goes through, it ends up being two powers. There is pagan, papal Rome and Islam, the king of the north. And the king of the south. But the king of the north ends up overcoming the king of the south. In other words, Roman Catholicism ends up overcoming Islam. And you can see that today. How do you see it today? Well, there was a battle which developed about a thousand years ago that ended up becoming the Ottoman Empire. That was the battle of Islam trying to push against Rome. Istanbul used to be called Constantinople when it was pagan Rome. Constantine made it Constantinople. It became Istanbul when the Muslims took it over. Okay? And they were battling. And that's what the, you ended up with the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire fell. And now we have seen, especially you've seen this over the last 30 years, the United States is being used as an arm of Rome, which is described in Revelation chapter 13. It's, it's, it's the, the, the lamb-like beast that looks like a lamb and speaks as a dragon. That's the United States of America. Again, I don't have time to go into all these because we're not focusing on that right now. But it's doing all the business of Rome. It says it exercises all the power of the first beast before it. And, and, and does all these miracles in the sight of the first beast, the first beast being papal Rome, then come the United States of America. Now, that being the case, the United States of America has been spanking Muslim countries for the last 30 years. You've seen it. First, there was the first Iraq war, a second Iraq war, a war in Afghanistan. Now they're going crazy in Syria. This is no accident. Okay, it's no accident. And already the leaders of Islam, all of the leaders of Islam have kissed the Pope's ring. All of them have. Okay. So it's already a, a spanking that's the king of the north overcoming the king of the south. Okay. So let's look at Daniel chapter 11 and we'll take it from there. Daniel chapter 11. Now, so the king of the north, let's start. I'm going to start at verse Talking about Roman, the papal Roman power, Daniel chapter 11, I'm going to start at verse 36. So this king is talking about in Daniel 11 and verse 36, king of the north is papal Rome. Remember that it's the little horn, papal Rome, which is the foundation of Christianity. Christianity did not start with, with the Messiah. I defy anybody. Show me in the Bible where Messiah started a religion called Christianity. 
Show me in the Bible when Messiah said he was doing away with what was taught to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You won't find it because it didn't do it. Just like Abraham wasn't an inventor of any religion called Judaism. Abraham did not invent any religion. Abraham was following the God that Noah followed. The God that Eber, who became the Hebrew father, and our facts say, and Shem, and Seth, and Enoch, and Methuselah, they, Abraham was following that God. He didn't create any new religion, especially one called Judaism. There's no Judaism in the Bible. Now, both Christianity and Judaism take part of their basis from the Bible, part of their basis, but not the whole thing. Neither of them take the whole thing because they're not true from the most high. They're from man. So here in Daniel chapter 11, verse 36, I'm going to start reading from verse 36 and I'm going to go down from verse 36 and I'm going to read to verse 43 and I'm going to stop there for a moment. Okay. And the king, that is the papal power, shall do according to his will. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God and shall speak marvelous things against the God of God and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor desire women, nor any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strong in the most strongholds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. At that time. And at that time of, excuse me, and at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overcome and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land and many shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and chief of the children of Ammon. And he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all precious things of Egypt and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Now, let's break this down. Again, I'm sorry for the speed, but we have a lot to cover. OK, because there's a lot of people being deceived by this. When it says he shall eat and Moab and Ammon shall escape out of his hand. The word escape is the word deliver. That is not saying that Edom, Moab, and Ammon belong to the Most High. It's not saying that. And what's going on, the reason that's so dangerous is because Moab and Ammon today are what makes up the, king, the nation of Jordan. And there are Israelites that are moving to Jordan thinking that they're safe. And it's the farthest thing from the truth. What you need to understand is the reason they're delivered is, for example, the same reason that if you live in the United States of America, right? You live in the United States of America, you're not in Venezuela where there's food shortages and there's puppet governments. You're not in places like Liberia where there have been overthrows of governments and people have been murdered. You're not there. So you're, in a sense, delivered by bringing the United States of America. Is the United States of America y'all's favorite nation? Of course not. It works for Asatan. So why, is it, why are you here? Because, because you're on Asatan's ground, and for now, he's ruling. That's what's happening here in Daniel. Edom, as I'm going to show you, is going to be destroyed. And the Edomites are not who people think they are. And this is another thing I wanted to bring out. We, as Bible students, sometimes tend to think that everybody in what I call a monolith, like, for example, there are Israelites that teach all Caucasians are going to be lost and all Israelites are going to be saved. That is not true. All Edom is not going to be lost 